Suspense. Among wine stewards, the men who are responsible for the wine selections in the cellars of famous hotels and restaurants, the choice is C-R-E-S-T-A, B-L-A-N-C-A, Cresta, Blanca, Cresta Blanca. Yes, with professional hosts who know how to please the palates of America's most discriminating guests, Cresta Blanca California wines richly bespeak gracious hospitality. So compliment your guests by serving the best. For distinguished entertaining, pour magnificent Cresta Blanca sherry, port, muscatel, or any Cresta Blanca wine. From the finest of the vines, it's Cresta Blanca wine. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines for your everyday enjoyment. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, bring you Mr. Walter Abel in Quiet Desperation, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. During my lunch hour one day. Funny, I can't even remember the name of the book. Anyway, the sentence was, The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I couldn't seem to get past that sentence, quiet desperation. That was me the author was talking about, Homer Biglow. And suddenly I thought, why should I go on like that? I was desperate, okay, but why should I be quiet? Why shouldn't I do something about it? Get myself out of the rut. All I needed was the right break. It came a lot sooner than I expected. One day, just before my vacation, I happened to overhear Mr. Pearson, he's president of the bank, talking to one of the bank's directors, Corbin Vandegrift. Usually their conversation is about debentures or first mortgages or government issues. That stuff doesn't interest me. Today, there was talk. their talk was a horse of another color. It was a hot day, and the door of the boss's office was open. They didn't even know I was alive. Well, I understand she's no great beauty, but it's just as well she doesn't attract too much attention going through customs at both ends. Do you mean to say, Corbin, that a young girl is willing to take the risk of violating her country's currency control? Evidently. Of course, she feels exactly as the father does. But they should be free over there to spend their own money wherever they choose. Right. Old Vale would break every law they've written here just for the satisfaction of knowing he's outwitted them. Mm-hmm. And Hester probably feels the same way about it. Well, <laughs> then he'll probably get quite a kick out of slipping 20,000 pounds out of the country. Uh, not pounds, John. But they might as well be. They're just about as negotiable as cold cash. But when that girl turns them over to me, I can walk into any dealer in the city and get full market value in ten minutes. And I intend to do it for them. I'm in complete sympathy. No government on earth could tell me where and when and how to spend my own money. Uh, once she gets the money, what is she going to do with it? Oh, I don't know, and I don't care. My guess is that she's going to do some shrewd buying of highly scarce products for a shipment back abroad. Leave it a veil to find a profitable deal. <laughs> when is she arriving? Monday, young Elizabeth. I've engaged a suite for her at the ambassador. I wrote them that I'd meet her at the boat, take her to her hotel, get the uh, negotiables, and exchange them for her. That afternoon, she can throw the dollars out of the window for all that matters to me. My duty will be over. Well, aren't you going to entertain her while she's here? See hmm? that she has a good time? Entertain her? Sure. Well, I should say not. I don't even know the girl. Besides, I'm a little old for that sort of thing. Oh, Corbin. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I wondered what Mr. Pearson would say if any of us employees at the bank were to play fast and loose with the law the way Corbin Vandegrift and that snooty dame Hester Vale were doing. He wouldn't be quite so sympathetic and understanding. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. That kind of skullduggery was labeled strictly for the rich. I should have put the whole thing out of my mind, but somehow I couldn't. 20,000 pounds. $80,000 in American money. I stood there outside Mr. Pearson's office. I was shaken out of my quiet desperation somehow. I just stood there, dreaming about romance and adventure that you could buy with money. Well, Homer, you all set for your vacation? Oh, yes, yes, sir. Leaving Friday for good old Eel River. My 13th year up there. Well, well, 
I envy you. I won't be going up until September. Well, then you'll be fishing up at Eel River again this summer, too. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. I wouldn't miss it for anything. I wrote Emil and told him to expect me. Say, we'll be quite a party this year, five of us. Uh, by the way, did I tell you about the trout I caught last year? Yes. It weighed close The to bank president and his lowly employee both went to the same place for their vacation. But what a difference. When he went out fishing, he had two guides per man with him. To pack and to carry, to paddle and to cook, to set up camp, to do everything that needed doing. Whereas I had to do well, everything for myself and by myself. Have a good time, Homer. I'll see you when you return. I'll say goodbye now, son. I won't be back anymore today. Goodbye, sir, and thank you. I had my lunch that day as usual. In the boardroom, Jenny, Mr. Pearson's secretary, had left the door to his office open so that if the phone should ring, I could take the message while she was out. The phone did ring, and it was Corbin Vandergrift. <coughs> Who is this? This is Homer Biglow, Mr. Vandergrift. Uh, oh, yes, Homer. Excuse me. I, uh, make sure uh, to give this message to Mr. Pearson. I'm laid up here in the country with a cold. Won't be able to get in the city for that appointment on Monday. Mr. Pearson knows about it. <coughs> I say Mr. Pearson knows about it. Ask him to meet Miss Vale at the boat for me and see to it that she's settled at the hotel. Tell him not to expect me back in the city until next Wednesday at the earliest. Yes, sir. Uh, tell him I'll uh, take care of that financial matter for Miss Vale when I get in. It can wait until Wednesday. Yes, sir. And tell him not to bother to call me. I'm going to spend this week in bed. I, I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Homer. Hmm. So Mr. Vandergrift was indisposed. Too bad. And now the girl would have to be met by a substitute, a stranger. Well, she didn't know either Vandergriff or Pearson from a hole in the ground. So what did it matter? And if it came to that, why did the substitute have to be Mr. Pearson? Why couldn't it be me? For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Walter Abel in Quiet Desperation. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is being brought to you by Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Mark Twain once said, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, that may have been true in Mark Twain's time, but today it's a different story. Today, there's an easy way to beat the heat. Just half fill a glass with better-tasting Roma wine, such as rich Roma Tokay, fruity Roma Zinfandel, or mellow Roma Claret. Add ice, fill up with soda, sweeten to taste, and garnish with fragrant mint or fruit slices. Then... Lean back and enjoy Roma Wine and Soda, America's smartest, coolest summer drink. I'm sure you'll agree that Roma Wine and Soda, so delicious, so refreshing, so cool to come home to, is the perfect warm weather thirst quencher. Perfect for summer entertaining. So inexpensive, too. It's a hot idea to treat your family and friends to cold, refreshing Roma Wine and Soda made with better-tasting Roma wines, America's favorite wines. And now, Roma wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Walter Abel as Homer Biglow, with Kathy Lewis as Hester Vale in Quiet Desperation, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. My days of quiet desperation were over. Anyone taking a real close look at me that Friday wouldn't have been sure I had a fever. My face felt hot, and every now and then I had a fit of trembling, but evening finally came. I gulped down some food at the cafeteria, picked up my bags at home, and went to the station. The next day, I was saying hello to Emil on the platform of the Eel River Station. <laughs> hello, Omer. Comment ça va? Hello, Emil. Glad to see you again. <laughs> How is my bon ami, Mr. Pearson? Eh? Fine. He sends his regards. How's the fishing? Oh, magnifique. The best ever, eh? <laughs> Many others on the river, Emil? Not the one. The fish, they are hungry like anything. And not the one to give them small fly to eat. Now you come, Omer, and they will be all for you. That's fine. 
I'll get started right out. Is everything all set? Oh, we too, Clyde. Everything is ready, eh? I <laughs> cut. In half an hour, I was at the camp on the shore of Eel River. I had lunch, changed my clothes, put my city clothes into my pack instead of into my suitcase, which I was going to leave in camp. And by three o'clock, I was a good eight miles up Eel River. By four, I had hidden my canoe and equipment in some bushes along the bank and, dressed again in city clothes, was walking slowly through the woods toward Loudon's Corner three miles away. It was a local stop on the railroad just below Eel River. The train south was due in at nine that night. I had plenty of time to catch it and make the transfer to Boston for the night train to New York. At the Boston station, I bought a cheap suitcase and a couple of shirts, and when the train dropped me at Grand Central early Sunday morning... I went straight to the 49th Street Hotel, which was just a couple of blocks from the Ambassador. I scrawled the name Henry Smith in the register and was shown to my room. I had a whole day and a night to wait, and for once, with all that time on my hand, I didn't read a book. Excuse me, where could I find Miss Vale, one of the passengers? What? What name? Hester Vale. Vale? Well, look over there by the fees. If you hadn't gone through, she's probably there. Thank you. That's okay. Show help me, I'm going to call. Miss Vale? Miss Vale? Over here. Oh, good morning, Miss Vale. I'm... You're Mr. Vandergrift. That's right. So good of you to come. My father promised you'd meet me. How is your father? Very well, thank you. Still growling about Europe's ruin. It's been a beastly nuisance, this waiting. Bye. Very warm in America. Is there anything I can do to help? Thank you. That chap finally finished mucking about my boxes. You think I was an adventurous, smuggling something priceless into your country, wouldn't you? <laughs> Had nothing to declare, you know. Came with empty trunks. Expect fill them up while I'm here. Can't buy a thing in Europe, you know. Europe's a dreadful nightmare. Yes, so I understand. Father wrote you all about it, did he? Yes. Foolish of him to write. The mail might have been open. Oh, no. After all, the war's over. Yes, it. Well, shall I take you to your hotel? You probably want to rest. Rest? Not at all. I'm scooting out to the shops right off. You have enough money for shopping? They allowed me a hundred pounds. I still have most of it. That'll do for a starter. If they'd only known about, you know. <laughs> yes, if you, if you care to turn the uh, uh, contraband over, I could see about converting it into dollars for you. Contraband? Spies and all that sort of thing. I describe it exactly. It's very nice. Not now. I'll dig them out at the hotel. All right. Is there anything you'd like to do this evening? Oh, dear. I don't want to impose on your time. You're not imposing. It's a pleasure. But I'd like to see you play. One of your bright American musicals, if possible. I think that can be arranged. Nice. Suppose I call for you at seven. We can have dinner and then go to the theater. That's splendid. Spicely kind of you. No, forget it. I, I haven't seen a musical myself. Well, not for a long time, anyway. <laughs> I took her to her suite at the Ambassador. Then I went back to my room to think over my plan. It was almost too simple. As soon as she turned the securities over to me, I'd take them to a broker and collect. Then I'd catch the night train back to Loudon's Corner, then through the woods to Eel River. By tomorrow afternoon, I'd be in my canoe again as if nothing had happened. A few days after that, the canoe would come drifting down river wrong side up, and my stuff would be found floating in a quiet backwater. Under another name, I'd go out west. With $80,000, I'd never have to go back to that old life of quiet desperation. No, sir, I was through with that forever. As for the man who posed as Corbin Vandergrift, huh, he'd never be found. And no one would ever connect him with the Homer Biglow who was drowned on a fishing trip in the swift waters of Eel River 250 miles away. Good evening, Miss Vale. Hello. Right on time. How was the shopping? Oh, I say, it left me quite speechless. I can't wait until I can really go on a spree. Hmm. Are we ready? Oh, you are? Quite. Oh, dear. Will you hold this key for me? There should be no room in my bag for it. Sure, I'll keep it in my pocket for you. Thank you. I picked a quiet little restaurant where I was sure I wouldn't meet anyone who knew me. The theater was going to be an ordeal, all those people, but that couldn't be helped. I had to play my part until she handed over those securities. I couldn't afford to look too anxious about them either, but I needn't have worried. Well? While we were waiting for the dessert, she opened her bag and pulled out a package of about a dozen small envelopes, different sizes and different shapes. Here you are, Miss Vandergrift. Take good care of them. Uh, are these? They are. 
I put them in my inside pocket. All the way down Broadway in the taxi, I felt them. The envelopes were too small, it seemed to me, to hold securities. Maybe if they were folded over. But even then, they would have to be bulkier than they were. I had to look into those envelopes and know if the securities were really there. But I had no chance, and it wasn't until the taxi dropped us in front of the theater that I was able to make one. Well, here we are. Miss Vale, I wonder if you'd mind seeing the show alone. Oh, dear. <laughs> I don't know what did it to me, but I've suddenly got a terrific headache. Oh, that is too bad. Oh, I'll be, it'll be all right. I just thought the music and the excitement wouldn't help much. No, I should think not. I'm supposed to take you back to the hotel, then you can go right home. But wouldn't you like to see the show by yourself? Well, you could, you know, and then take a taxi back to the ambassador. Yes, I suppose I could. I should hate to think a headache of mine spoiled your whole evening. Here, you take the tickets and go on in. Thank you, I will. I'm dreadfully sorry you have to miss it. Oh, I'll make up for it another time, Miss Vale. There are plenty of musicals you will want to see. You'll be sure to take something for the headache now, won't you? I will. Thanks a lot for being so considerate. <laughs> Good night, Miss Vale. Have a good time. I'm sure to. Good night, Miss Vale. Back in my hotel room with shaking hands, I opened the envelopes. There were nothing but letters from her friends, sent to her from different parts of the world, not a single security in any of them. Could it have been a mistake? Did she hand me the wrong package? It didn't seem possible. Maybe she suspected something was wrong and played a trick on me. I was sweating and reached for my handkerchief, and that's when I felt her hotel key still in my pocket. <gasps> I threw the package of letters into my suitcase and walked over to the ambassador two blocks away. Her key opened the door, and I was alone in her suite. I had until at least 11.30, two and a half hours. I took my time about it, making sure to put everything back exactly as I found it. I searched her baggage, the bureau drawers, the closet, every conceivable place even under the rugs and found exactly nothing. She had them on her then. I turned the light off and went into the bedroom to wait. Soon after 11.30, I heard the outer door open. Really, I'm terribly sorry to have caused this trouble, Mr. Vandergood, for suddenly taking a headache, or I'm sure he would have forgotten to return my key. Oh, that's all right. It really doesn't matter. He can use his duplicate until he returns it to you. It is a bother, though. Oh, not at all, Miss Vale. It happens often. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <gasps> oh! Oh, Mr. Vandergriff, what are you doing I'm here? I'm sorry to disturb you, oh, Miss Vale, but I had to come back. You see, you forgot to give me the securities. Securities? Yes, the securities I was to have sold for you. But, my dear man, I did give you the securities. Oh, no, there wasn't anything in the package except some letters from friends of yours. Who are you? You're not Mr. Vandergriff. Miss Vale, what my name is doesn't matter very much. By this time, it's enough for you to know that I want those securities, and I mean to get them, hand them over. You get out of here. I warn you, Miss Vale, I don't want to get nasty, but I'm not going to leave without them. Stay away from me. The securities, Miss Vale. Say not, no. Where no. are they? No! Miss Vale, tell me. I don't want to hurt you. The more she struggled, the tighter I gripped her throat. Her arms beat weakly against my sides, and suddenly I got some attitude that I... Where are they? Where are they? Tell me, where are they? My fingers tightened and strained against her soft flesh. Then suddenly, she quit struggling. And when I loosened my grip, she fell down on the floor, unconscious. Where was that purse of hers? Ah, there. I ripped it open. Nothing there but a powder compact and a lipstick and some change. Where could they be? She'd have to tell me. I'd make her. Miss Vale, wake up. Miss Vale! She didn't move. And then I saw... She wasn't breathing anymore. I'd killed her. I never meant to kill the girl. I hadn't any idea I was choking her that hard. All I wanted was... But now I had to get away. I couldn't stay here with that limp body sprawled on the rug. But I had to be careful. I couldn't afford to make a mistake now. I tried to remember everything I'd read in detective stories. You had to be careful about fingerprints. I ran to the bathroom, grabbed the towel, and with it wiped every surface I might have touched. Then I dragged the body to the bedroom and put it on the bed. I shut the door behind me and turned the lights off in the sitting room. I listened a couple of seconds at the outer door. Everything was quiet. I ducked out and went to the stairs. The lobby was empty. I crossed over and went out into Park Avenue. Five minutes later, I was at my hotel. It was 12.30. I could still catch the one o'clock train for Boston.
fine mess I'd made. The best thing that could happen to me now... Mind you, the best thing would be to get back home to the boarding house, to the bank, to that horrible, hopeless rut I'd tried to get away from. That was the best I had to look forward to. The worst... I didn't even have the courage to look at that. But then, how could they pin it on me? If anybody had anything to worry about, it wasn't me. It was Vandergriff. He had the date with her, not I. As far as anybody knew, I didn't know any such person as Hester Vale ever existed. Vandergriff was the guy she told the desk clerk she'd given the key to. I bet the poor sap wouldn't even be able to prove an alibi for last night, midnight. Yes. Ha huh. I could go back to my fishing and forget the whole thing. Forget it ever happened. I was safe. Huh. Fine consolation that was. After all the beautiful plans I'd made. But at least... I was safe. In Boston, I checked the new suitcase. I could pick it up on the way home. The local dropped me at Loudon's Corner. By noon... I was sitting over my campfire, having a bite just like any other fellow out on a fishing trip. Ten days later, on a Saturday morning, I was back at Emil's camp. Uh, well, Mr. Bigelow, how was the fishing, huh? Fine, Emil, fine. Oh, oh, oh. you get my nice sunburn. Uh, last the rest of the year, anyway. Did huh? I really get that, Brown? Oh, like a berry, huh? Yeah, real nice and quiet, no? I have no party fishing before September when Mr. Pearson come with the four friends. Yes, I know. He told me. Oh, he's some fisherman, Mr. Pearson. Always try for record. But you don't care for record, eh, Mr. Bigelow? <laughs> you you lead the simple, the, the quiet life. I, I guess so. But you enjoy it, no? Enjoy it? Well, I try my best. <laughs> you have uh, other hobby, maybe, no, eh? No, no, I don't have any other hobbies except reading. Oh, uh, Mr. Pearson and me, we have same hobby. That's uh, why we such good friends. I didn't know that. Oh, we we great one for uh, philately, les timbres, the stamp, you know. Huh? Someday I show you my collection. It feels three albums, but I have not so good collection like Mister Pearson. But then I no have so much money. Neither have I. Oh, you make joke. <laughs> Mister Pearson is very wealthy, I know. But still, Emil can give him some stamp once in a while. I have few uh, duplicates. You do me a big favor and give them to Mr. Pearson. I make me compliment, eh? Why? Oh, sure. I'd be glad to. Ah, yeah. Now I drive you to station. Next year you come again, no? Yes, I'll come again. Well, well, Homer, you're back, eh? Did you enjoy your rest? Yes, it was fine, Mr. Pearson. Oh, uh, good, good. I can't say we've had any enjoyment back here. Have you heard about Mr. Vandergrip? Mr. Vandergrip? No, sir. Is there something wrong? Wrong? <laughs> I'll say there is. He's been arrested for murder. He insists he's innocent, but the police have a strong case against him. Very strong. It looks bad. Bad indeed. I'm sorry, sir. Ah, uh, so are we all. It means I'll have to give up my fishing trip this summer for one thing. I can't desert dear old Vandy at such a time. I'll have to wire Emil, and I just got a letter from him telling me he had everything arranged to... Yes, he told me he was expecting you. Oh, well. Can't be helped, I guess. Oh, say, by the way, he wrote that he sent some duplicates onto me in your care. Stamps. Stamps? Mm. Oh, that's right, he did. Sorry, I forgot about them, Mr. Pearson. I must have had them at home. I'll, I'll bring them in tomorrow, sir. Well, there's no hurry, no hurry. I have no mind for them now, anyway. Well, back to work. Come on, go back to work. That night I looked for the stamps, but couldn't find them. How I ever managed to lose them, I'll never know. Now I'd have to explain to Mr. Pearson. No. No, I wouldn't have to explain. I still had those letters, her letters. They were from foreign countries. I'd take the stamps from those envelopes and give them to Mr. Pearson. He'd never know the difference. I knew how fussy he could get about a little thing like lost stamps. Rather than get him started on a lecture, I got out the package of letters, cut the stamps off, and then burned the letters and the envelopes. The next day... Uh, yes? Here are the stamps, sir. I found them at home, all right. Oh, oh well, just put them on the desk, Homer. Thank you very much. Don't mention it, Mr. Pearson. I was having my lunch later in the boardroom when Mr. Pearson came in. He had a stranger with him, a tall man with an angry face. Oh, so here you are, Homer. Yes, sir. Homer, I want you to meet Mr. Scott. How do you do? All right. Those, uh, those stamps you gave me, Homer... 
Are you sure you got them from Emil? Oh, yes, sir. Just before I left, he gave them to me for you. No, Homer. No, I just called Emil. He told me he gave you some recent French issues. Those weren't the stamps you gave me. Well, Mr. Pearson, I guess you found me out. You see, I lost the stamps Emil gave me, and I didn't want to disappoint you, so I went to a stamp dealer's and picked up a dozen odd stamps to replace them. I didn't think it would make much difference. Is that your story, Big Law? Why, what do you mean? It's true. They were very rare and valuable stamps, Homer. You must have shelled out a pretty penny for them. Oh, I don't know. Mr. Pearson feels a man in your position couldn't afford to buy stamps like those unless, uh... Unless what? Unless you didn't buy them at all, Big Loan. Unless you got them from the late Miss Hester Vale. What's the matter, Homer? Is the name familiar to you? Oh, no, no, sir. I never heard of... What makes us think so is that the stamps Miss Vale smuggled into this country were the same issues and worth exactly as much. Eighty thousand dollars. <sighs> We're worth 80000 Could it uh, be a coincidence, Mr. Biglow? Quiet desperation. I've been catching up on my reading here in prison while waiting. I found another good quote. Happiness is the absence of pain. Suspense. Quiet Desperation, starring Walter Abel and presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better-tasting wines selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. More Americans enjoy Roma wines than any other wines because Roma wines taste better. To create this better taste, Roma begins with natural juices, gently pressed from California's choicest grapes. Then Roma master vintners, with ancient skill and unmatched winemaking resources, guide these luscious grape treasures unhurriedly to taste perfection. Then, these better-tasting wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before. And from these, the world's greatest wine reserves, Roma later selects for your pleasure. Right now, a wonderful way to discover the better taste of Roma wines is to serve Roma wine and soda, iced for cool, lip-smacking refreshment, enjoy delicious Roma wine and soda made with your favorite Roma wine. That's Roma, America's largest selling wines. Walter Abel will soon be seen in the Hal Roach production, Fabulous Joe. Tonight's suspense play was by George and Gertrude Fass. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Donald O'Connor as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Edmund O'Brien, John Lund, Lloyd Nolan, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.